Madam Speaker, I rise today in strong support of H.R. 5, the Equality Act, which amends the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and other core civil rights statutes to explicitly prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. The bill would also strengthen non-discrimination protections for women and others. In short, this long overdue legislation will provide millions of LGBTQ Americans explicit protections from being denied medical care, fired from their jobs, or thrown out of their homes simply because of who they are. Much of the history of the United States has been about expanding the definition of who is understood to be included when the Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal. When these words were first written, that phrase did not include black and Latino men, it did not include Native Americans, it did not include women, and it did not include LGBTQ individuals. Once again, we have an opportunity to continue our march toward justice, to enshrine in our nation's laws protections for marginalized communities, to ensure that everyone can fully participate in key areas of life, and to provide them recourse in the face of discrimination. Hello, and welcome to the C-SPAN in the Classroom podcast. I'm Zach, and I'm joined by my colleague, Pam. Each year, the United States celebrates Pride Month in June as a remembrance of the Stonewall Riots in New York City. June 28, 1969, marked the beginning of the Stonewall Uprising, a series of events between police and LGBTQ plus protesters. According to the Library of Congress, the events that would unfold over the six days would fundamentally change the discourse surrounding LGBTQ plus activism in the United States. These events were the catalyst that brought the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer movement to a new level. What began as a one-day recognition grew to a month-long celebration that now includes marches, parades, concerts, festivals, and educational experiences. However, the story of the LGBTQ plus movement in the United States extends far before the Stonewall Uprising. And as we heard from Representative Jerry Nadler of New York, legislation such as the Equality Act, which has been passed by the House of Representatives, continues the story toward the future. Join us as we explore C-SPAN's vast video archive to explore the history of LGBTQ plus activism, the contributions of key people, and the significance of notable events as we celebrate Pride Month. Thank you for joining us today for our conversation on Pride Month. And as you pointed out in your introduction, Zach, progress in the LGBTQ plus community has been made in recent years, but we recognize there is still work to be done. Before we get into modern day celebration, it's important to explore the history. Let's look back to the 1950s, the post-World War II era. It was a time of opportunity for people to secure jobs, purchase homes, televisions and cars, and seek educational opportunities. But it was also a time when the civil rights movement became part of mainstream life in the country, with the Brown versus Board of Education decision and activist Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat on the bus. This period also marked the beginning of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. There was a fear of communism spreading in the country in places like the government, universities, even Hollywood, fueled by the efforts of Senator Joe McCarthy. This became known as the Red Scare, which attempted to identify individuals in institutions who may have either been considered communists or were affiliated with communists. Parallel to all of this was the experience LGBTQ plus people were having. The public was less accepting and oftentimes was less aware of this community. In 1953, President Eisenhower signed Executive Order 10450, which precluded lesbian and gay people from being employed by the federal government. And similar to the Red Scare, this led to another movement to oust LGBTQ plus people from government institutions, and it was called the Lavender Scare. Let's listen to a clip of author Douglas Charles talking about this time period. There quickly evolved a decidedly public witch hunt for gays in the 1950s, one that was similar to, yet distinct from, the witch hunt for communists in government. Today, the gay witch hunt is known as the Lavender Scare. The State Department had already begun purging gays from its ranks in 1947, and the public witch hunt began in 1950 after Senator Joseph McCarthy singled out two cases not of political subversion, but sexual subversion in the State Department which led the State Department to purge itself of gays, very quickly firing 91. 
Soon after this, Americans focused on the topic and it engrossed them for years. One American wrote President Truman, quote, if the State Department can acquire and harbor 91 homosexuals who presumably had something to do with shaping our foreign policy or slanting the information on which it is based, the State Department is capable of anything. The Lavender Scare actually long outlived the Red Scare. In short order, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI responded. It had to respond. It was responsible for domestic security and responsible for protecting Americans from subversive influences. To demonstrate to the president the FBI was on top of the issue, in April 1950, Hoover forwarded to the White House a list of 393 people arrested in the Capitol for quote-unquote sexual irregularities. Concurrently, Hoover created the first version of the FBI Sex Deviates Program. This one was based upon arrest records and fingerprint records. Any time a person was arrested on a morals charge, which is soliciting gay sex, his arrest record and fingerprints were forwarded to the FBI, who then forwarded them to the Civil Service Commission. One person who was affected by the executive order was Frank Kameny. After serving in World War II, he obtained a degree in astronomy at Harvard University and went on to work with the Army Map Service. However, he was released from his position shortly thereafter due to reports that he was a homosexual. He went on to fight not only for his rights and the rights of LGBTQ plus people, but he was also a co-founder of the Mattachine Society, the first gay civil rights organization in Washington, D.C., that works to preserve and educate people on archival history of gay and lesbians in law, policy, and politics. And when looking through a historical lens of the LGBTQ plus community, there is another individual we should mention, Walt Whitman. And as you know, Zach, I love weaving literature into our conversations. It really reflects so much of what is occurring at the time. And we learn a lot about society and people's reactions through the work of authors and poets. I want to share this clip of author Christopher Bram talking about Walt Whitman's status as a poet and influence on gay culture. Whitman's a great example. I mean, he published his uh, poems in the 1850s. He included a new set of poems called the Calamus Poems, which are openly they're about sex between men. And it was uh, very kind of exciting and different. And in the years, next se uh, decades, uh, gay men and women too would refer back to these poems as here's somebody is finally writing about me. Somebody's telling my story. I don't talk about, I talk about that only briefly in my book because I'm talking about writers after World War II. But Whitman was a major breakthrough. Also, interestingly, about Whitman though is he did not want to be identified as gay. Once he became, fa became famous, he was insisting that he would get letters from men in same-sex relationships and he would claim, oh, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. He did not want to give up his celebrity for to be a spokesman for a small minority group. He was very nervous about that. So it's kind of sad. It was, uh, but we see the same thing happening later with the early generation of gay American writers I was talking about. It was, it was hard to come out. It was hard to let your desires be known. Well, Christopher Bram, and I don't know if this is a topic you're familiar with, but was Walt Whitman known to be gay among a, a wider circle rather than just his intimate circle? Uh, not among a wider circle, no. Perhaps listeners who are working with an LGBTQ plus curriculum could introduce this clip to students and have them follow up with reading some of Whitman's poetry to see how it reflects his perspective. So that brings us to 1969. Walt Whitman's experiences of hiding in plain sight were shared by many LGBTQ plus individuals from Whitman's time in the late 1800s all the way through the first seven decades of the 20th century. Let's listen to Patty Rule, former vice president of content and exhibit development at Museum here in Washington, D.C., discuss the role that the Stonewall Inn played in 1960s New York City. Now we're going to go back to a hot summer night in June of 1969 to Greenwich Village in New York City, the Stonewall Inn. 
Stonewall Inn wasn't a particularly nice bar. Uh, the drinks were watered down. It was run by the mafia. But it was a place that gay people could come and dance together and socialize. Remember back then, it's illegal for gay people to socialize together, to be seen showing affection in public. At the Stonewall, they could actually dance together. Um, the Stonewall Inn actually preyed on the, um, the gay Wall Street workers who socialized there. There was sort of a blackmailing ring going on there. So again, not the nicest place, but at least it was a place that gay people could call their own. So um, there's a police crackdown on such illegal establishments going on. And when police came in and started raiding the bar and tossing people out of it, um, they were a little bit rough with a lesbian and they threw her out onto the streets and the crowd went wild. Um, This is kind of a pent up feeling by the people there at the Stonewall. Um, Police had been harassing gay people for a long time, arresting them for showing affection in public. At this point in time, in 1969, we've got um, all kind of the youth movement, um, counterculture, sexual revolution is happening, and people just aren't going to take it anymore. They're done with, with not being who they are. They're done with not being accepted for being gay. They're just fed up. And so this starts six nights of on and off, uprising, rioting, glass throwing, brick throwing, interactions with police. And f- out of this moment springs forth what we call the modern LGBTQ rights movement. In the clip, Roll discusses how the Stonewall Inn was a place that gay people could call their own and was the impetus for the Stonewall Uprising. According to the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, the Stonewall Riots, quote, inspired LGBT people throughout the country to organize in support of gay rights. And within two years after the riots, gay rights groups have been started in nearly every major city in the United States. This clip is a small portion of a much larger bell ringer in which students can reflect on the cause and analyze the impact of this notable event. And as the gay rights movement expanded across the country, it also shifted with regard to purpose and tactics. There is a dramatic shift in the way people organized and pushed back on policies. Prior to the Stonewall uprisings, one tactic that groups would use to protest was to picket. As a matter of fact, According to WhiteHouseHistory.org, the first documented and organized gay rights picket was at the White House on April 17th, 1965. And an individual that you talked about earlier, Pam, Frank Kameny, led that demonstration. The website goes on to say that, quote, participants wore business attire to present themselves as respectable professionals and to draw attention to the issue at hand, which was discrimination in the workplace. Another method was to write articles to distribute in pamphlets such as The Homosexual Citizen, which was a publication of the Mattachine Society. One issue offered guidance on what to do if you got arrested. And one activist, who is actually the editor of this publication, was Lily Vincennes. We discovered a program that features Charles Francis, the president of the Mattachine Society of Washington, D.C., talking about the life of Vincennes and her many contributions to the gay rights movement. Here's a portion of a clip we made from that program. Born in Hamburg, Germany, she came to the U.S. when and what was her early years like here in the U.S.? Lily was born in Hamburg, Germany in 1937 when Hamburg was in Nazi Germany. And her parents... um, brought her uh, to the United States in 1949. And um, she went to Columbia to study literature. She joined the Women's Army Corps. And in the Women's Army Corps, uh, in a gay purge, which they frequently had in the Women's Army Corps, she got booted. And it was one of the greatest things that ever happened to her because she was able to shed all the pretense and be who she was as an openly gay uh, pioneer activist. Um, Growing up in a German family, there was a word kicked around in her house a lot when she was growing up, she used to say, and it was Lebenskunstler. She felt like she wanted to be a Lebenskunstler, and that is a German word which means a life artist, someone who looks at their life as a work of art, someone who masters uh, the art of living. And, Le- and she became, I believe, a Lebenskunstler, and that was a part of her German heritage. The 1970 film titled Gay and Proud, how did this come about? 
Gay and Proud is an amazing film that she decided to make on the first anniversary of the Stonewall riots, documenting the first parade, and it was called the Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade from Greenwich Village to Central Park. In addition to the film that Charles Francis mentioned, Vincennes produced another one entitled The Second Largest Minority, which was shot at Independence Hall in Philadelphia in 1968. Charles Francis explains that she had a vintage film projector and that she would travel to show her films and documentaries to groups of people, even at independent film festivals, to tell the story. She did not have a distribution system, and the major networks would not provide coverage of these events. Even the Stonewall Uprising was not widely covered, which emphasizes the important role that Lily Vincennes played during this time period. But let's listen to another portion from that program, which shows the contrast of protesting methods both before and after the Stonewall Uprising. Here's a portion from 1970, Gay and Proud. At first, I was very guilty. And then I realized that all the things that are taught you not only by society, but by psychiatrists, are just to fit you in a mold. And I've just rejected the mold, and when I rejected the mold, I was happier. These are mostly independent organizations all across the country. There's, there's somewhere between 60 and 75 independent groups across the United States, maybe more now because they keep growing up overnight. And uh, this is a unified effort on the part of uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 organizations on the East Coast. That from the film Gay and Proud. Why was this a tipping point for the gay rights movement? It was a generational change um, from the old school Mattachine where when they would pick it, they would wear jackets and ties and skirts and dresses to the new era that happened almost overnight after Stonewall in 1969. And, and, and she caught that change uh, in, in Gay and Proud from the old school second largest minority to Gay and Proud, the explosion of a cultural change from old Mattachine to gay liberation. While all of that was occurring on the East Coast, the West Coast was experiencing a transformation as well. In one of our book TV programs, we interviewed activist Cleve Jones. And in this next clip, we'll hear him talk about how San Francisco became a place for gay and lesbian people to settle. How is it that San Francisco became the mothership of the gay community? That's a very interesting question, and uh, it really, I think, goes back to World War II. Um, when the war ended, uh, and particularly, of course, the war in the Pacific, so many of the armed forces were decommissioned in the San Francisco Bay Area. Among them, of course, were large numbers of gay men and lesbian women who'd come from all over the country, especially the Midwest. Uh, they volunteered to fight for their country, and then they get decommissioned in San Francisco, and they get out at the Presidio, and I think many of them looked around and said, I'm not going back to Iowa. Uh, and that was really uh, the beginning of the modern community. But uh, I think uh, many historians would actually trace it back all the way to the 49ers and the, 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 all the miners that came out to San Francisco. It always had kind of a reputation as a place for bohemians. And, uh, but it was after World War II that it really solidified. While we are in San Francisco, one person who we should talk about, a person who had great impact on the gay and lesbian movement, was Harvey Milk. One fun fact for me is I learned about him is that he grew up on Long Island where he was also a teacher, so something we have in common. He enlisted in the Navy after graduating from college, but resigned after being asked about his sexual orientation. Cleve Jones goes on to talk about Harvey Milk's experience in San Francisco in the program. Let's take a listen. Harvey Milk, who was he? How did you become connected to him? Harvey Milk moved to San Francisco from New York. Uh, in his, his, he had just turned 40. Uh, he'd been through many different careers. He'd been in the Navy. He'd been a stock broker. He'd been a Republican. He'd lived most of his life in the closet. And then he came to San Francisco with his boyfriend, Scott Smith, and he opened a camera store on Castro Street and was part of transforming Castro Street from a kind of sleepy Scandinavian and Irish neighborhood into the, the center of the known gay world at the time. Um, he was a very kind man. He was very compassionate. He was very funny. 
But I think uh, the main thing I would like people to know about Harvey Milk is that he was, in most regards, a very ordinary person. He was uh, not a genius. He was not a saint. His life was uh, full of all of the challenges and often defeats and humiliations that most of us endure in our own lives. But he had courage, and his love for his city and his community was most genuine, and he became a very important symbol for our community worldwide following his assassination in 1978. He was a San Francisco su uh, supervisor at the yes, time. Yes, the Connors equivalent of city council, correct. Mm -hmm. In my research, I discovered what an iconic person he is in the LGBTQ plus community, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. Time magazine included him in their 100 most important people of the 20th century list. I would love to hear how teachers are using his story in classrooms, so listeners, please share your ideas with us in an email. From social emotional learning to seeking social changes, your students can learn a lot from Harvey Milk's story. And that touches on the 70s, Zach. As in previous decades, the 1980s and 1990s brought about many challenges for the LGBTQ plus community. Shortly after Harvey Milk's assassination in 1978, on June 5, 1981, UCLA's Dr. Michael Gottlieb authored the first report that identified the appearance of diseases that would later become known as AIDS. NBC reported that President Ronald Reagan first spoke about AIDS in 1985 after over 12,000 Americans had died and the virus had already begun to spread very swiftly. And in 1988, Activists occupied the Food and Drug Administration headquarters in Rockville, Maryland, to protest for improved treatment and care, an event that your students can learn about with our related bell ringer activity, which we'll put up on our podcast page alongside the many other resources featured in this episode. But fast-forwarding a bit further, we reach 1998 and the murder of Matthew Shepard. According to the Matthew Shepard Foundation, on October 7th, Shepard, a 21-year-old student at the University of Wyoming, was brutally attacked and tied to a fence in a field outside of Laramie, Wyoming, and left to die. On October 12th, Matt succumbed to his wounds in a hospital in Fort Collins, Colorado. But his murder was also preceded by just four months by that of James Byrd Jr., a black man in Jasper, Texas, who, on June 7th, was dragged to his death after being chained by the ankles to the back of a pickup truck by three white men. Here's Vanita Gupta, president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, discussing the murders and the subsequent related legislative efforts. This year, we commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. The murders of Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr., shocked the moral conscience of America in 1998. The details of both scarred the nation. And the investigation into Matthew's death found incontrovertible evidence that his attackers had targeted him because he was gay. In the case of James Byrd Jr., the three men responsible for his killing were well-known white supremacists. But while the men responsible for the Shepard and Bird killings were later convicted of murder, none of them were prosecuted for committing a hate crime. At the time these murders, uh, at, the, at the time that these murders were committed, neither Wyoming nor Texas had a hate crimes law. And existing federal hate crimes protections did not include violent acts against those engaged in, based on victim sexual orientation, and they actually only covered racial violence against those engaged in federally protected activity, such as voting or attending school. This legislation marked a profoundly important expansion of the federal hate crimes laws to include crimes motivated by gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability, and without having to show that the defendant was engaged in federally protected activity. Both Shepard's and Byrd's murderers were convicted for murder, but no existing hate crimes laws existed in Texas or Wyoming at the time. And beyond this, federal hate crime legislation only applied to, quote, federally protected activities, like voting, according to Gupta. However, the 2009 Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act would change this requirement. 
The act also allows the federal government to provide assistance in the investigation and prosecution of hate crimes and ensures that crimes which target their victims because of race, color, religion, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability are all covered by the law. This shift in federal legislation could offer a very unique learning opportunity for your students to explore the history of hate crimes and hate crime legislation throughout the 21st century, especially with recent efforts to address ongoing hate crimes here in the United States. But let's shift to two other arenas of federal law, those of military policy and of marriage. In 1993, President Clinton's administration enacted the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy, which permitted gay and lesbian citizens to serve in the military, provided they did not reveal their sexual orientation. It also stated that they were not to be asked about their sexual orientation or be discriminated against. This was, however, reversed in 2010 when President Obama signed the repeal of this policy, which enabled gay and lesbian people to serve openly in the military. And in 1996, President Clinton signed the Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, which defined marriage as a legal union between one man and one woman at the federal level. And this impacted gay couples in a number of ways. It had tax implications, and couples could also not benefit from programs such as health care plans. And the argument made its way to the Supreme Court in the United States versus Windsor case. Let's listen to Roberta Kaplan talk about her experience arguing against the Defense of Marriage Act before the United States Supreme Court. Her client in this case was Edith Windsor, who sued the federal government for failing to recognize her marriage to another woman. She grew up uh, in Philadelphia uh, during the Depression. Her father lost his family uh, business in their home during the Depression. And she, um, during college, she went to Temple University. She realized that she was a lesbian, but because of the time then, uh, as she put it, she couldn't imagine being a queer. Um, and she married a guy by the name of Saul Windsor, that's how she gets the name, um, uh, who was her brother's best friend and who had fought with her, fa- her brother in World War II. Um, the marriage, needless to say, didn't last very long. After only a few months, um, Edie said to Saul, you deserve to be loved the way you deserve to be loved, and I need something else. Uh, and so she effectively came out to him back then, and she moved to New York, uh, like so many other people, including myself, in order to be gay, her words. Um, flash forward, I can tell, I can go on and on about Edie's life, and I'm sure I will today, but flash forward many years, uh, she met a woman by the name of Thea Spire, Uh, They were together for 44 years. Um, They were married uh, in Canada. It's actually my fault. I lost the New York case, so they had to go to Canada. (laughs) I think I paid her back for it, though. (laughs) Um, And um, uh, upon Thea's death, um, even though she realized she was going to have this problem, she didn't fully appreciate the extent of it, uh, she had to pay an enormous estate tax uh, because of this statute known as the the so-called Defense of Marriage Act. I don't think it was defending any marriages. Um, And the reason she had to pay that state tax is under this law, uh, the marriages of gay people for purposes of federal law were not marriages, although the marriages of straight people were. So if you're a straight couple and you were married, obviously you don't have to pay an estate tax when your spouse dies if you inherit their property. But if you were a member of a gay married couple, you did because it wasn't a marriage. Your spouse wasn't a spouse and Thea was like a stranger to her. The court released its decision in June 2013, and with a vote of 5 to 4, it ruled that defining marriage as being between one man and one woman was unconstitutional under the Fifth Amendment Equal Protection Clause. With the decision being so close, students could research how each of the justices ruled in this case, present their findings, and after hearing its perspective, they could offer their opinion on the case. And so by 2013, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and a portion of the Defense of Marriage Act were found to be unconstitutional. Picking up on the topic of marriage, we can turn to the historic Obergefell v. Hodges Supreme Court case, in which James Obergefell was a plaintiff. We had him as a guest on C-SPAN's Washington Journal program, where he talked about the genesis of this case and the outcome. Let's listen. How did you become part of that case? (sighs) Really, by virtue of unexpected occurrences. Number one was my partner of almost 21 years, John, being diagnosed with ALS, dying of ALS. And on June 26, 2013, when the Windsor decision came out, striking down part of the Defense of Marriage Act, I 
simply spur of the moment asked him to marry me and he was in at-home hospice care at that point completely bedridden and we made it happen we couldn't marry at home in ohio because of a constitutional amendment so we chartered a medical jet and flew to baltimore where we got married on the tarmac and then by virtue of friends running to a friend of theirs who's a civil rights attorney and telling our story he asked if we might be willing to talk to him and that's how it all started and june 26 2015 how did that change the law of the land well at that um prior to that ruling you know it was a patchwork of laws across the country where some states allowed same-sex marriage other states did not and that ruling said across the entire country every state had to allow same-sex couples to marry and every state had to recognize lawful same-sex marriages from any other state in this case the court voted five to four that under the united states constitution the right to marry is guaranteed to same-sex couples under the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. In reflecting on the outcome and legacy of the case, students could research previous Supreme Court cases, such as Loving v. Virginia, and create a timeline to show how marriage has evolved over time in the legal sphere of the United States. As we wrap up this episode, we want to remember that this is a month not only of remembrance, but of celebration in the United States and globally. And there are lots of opportunities for people to learn about and be a part of an experience, whether it's a parade or a march, a conference or a summit, a dance party or a festival, or a run, and I've even seen walking tours advertised as well. We'd like to thank you once again for tuning in to the C-SPAN in the Classroom podcast for what is the 18th and final episode of our inaugural season. As actor George Takai once said, quote, We should indeed keep calm in the face of difference and live our lives in a state of inclusion and wonder at the diversity of humanity. While many of your school years may be just about finished if they're not completed already, we hope that the resources we presented in this episode will serve as valuable additions to your classroom and for your students in the months and years to come. And as a reminder, you can view all of the video resources that we shared today on our podcast page at c-span.org slash classroom. And if you would like to connect with our team or have ideas for future podcast episodes, please email us anytime at educate at c-span.org. And that's a wrap. Thank you for tuning into our podcast this year. We've enjoyed exploring new topics and providing in-depth resources for you to use with your students. If you miss any episodes, please go to our podcast page and check out the variety of topics. See you in the fall.